Well, I learned, I learned Macbeth and Hamlet at school, so I guess I should... Uh, uh, although that then associates in my mind with uh, with Cardiff, so that's not so good. Um, maybe Lady Macbeth. I'd, I've just written a book about psychopaths, and I guess um, I guess Lady Macbeth is probably a psychopath. I mean, she gets other people to do the bad stuff, and she's got no... Uh, I say she's got no conscience, but then there's the whole spot, damn spot business with the blood. So maybe she does have a bit of a conscience. Nonetheless, Lady Macbeth. A few books, I think, really influenced me hugely. One was um, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, Kurt Vonnegut, um, which had like an enormous impact on me because of, of, of the mix of comedy and horror, which is what I've done my whole career, is, is, is write sort of slapstick human comedies about terrible, terrible things. And, and that came from Slaughterhouse-Five. And also I learned from, from Slaughterhouse-Five simple unfancy short sentences where I don't think Vonnegut really tried to overly impress people with himself, you know, in the way that some writers do. So that I, I very much admired that about him. It's short, simple. As Raymond Carver once said, nothing skewers the heart with greater force than a full stop put in just the right place. Uh, and Raymond Carver was another one for that reason. Uh, and also there's a Jonathan Coe book called What a Carve Up that had an enormous impact on me because it was about tiny human domesticity clashing with enormous world events set in Thatcher's Britain in the 80s and it kind of politicised me, that book. And again, it was a clash of, of, of human comedy and great horror. I mean, I've made documentaries in the past, so I'm influenced by documentary makers. Nick Broomfield was a was a huge influence on me early on. Uh, the way that he sort of broke down the boundaries, I think, between what the story was about and, and the way you told the story, that was really important to me. Uh, so there's a particular Nick Broomfield documentary called The Leader, His Driver and The Driver's Wife, which is all about Nick Broomfield trying to get an interview with Eugene Ter Blanche, the South African neo-Nazi leader. And it's both hilarious and terrifying, but also it kind of felt, it felt very real because it was about Nick's you know, attempts to get an interview with the guy. It felt like you were really watching some real life. And again, it was a mix of, you know, comedy and horror, which I guess is the kind of thing that runs through all my stuff, um, all the things that, you know, influence me. So, yeah, Nick's films, um, I mean, music, of course, but only because it's nice to listen to. I can't really think of a song that's inspired me to write. Um, I remember when I was younger, I plagiarised... Bob Dylan, in a school essay, I said, the wind howls like a hammer, and it came back with a big X next to it, and the teacher wrote, the wind cannot howl like a hammer. <laughs> OK, wh whenever Cassio Ishiguro's got a book out, I'm incredibly excited, which was slightly dimmed by nocturnes, <laughs> I have to say, but I'm, I still hold up great hope for the next one. Uh, so Ishiguro, Paul Oster, I'll run out and buy a Paul Oster book. Jonathan Coe, definitely. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Lynn Barber's magazine journalism. I think she's a, she's the great magazine writer writing today. Um, hmm. I don't know what I've read recently that kind of blew. I was blown, I was blown away by the sisters brothers, uh, Patrick Dewitt. It's a really amazing book, so I'll, I'll rush out um, and see what he writes next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my life is all about schedule and discipline. Um, I'll wake up at half six in the morning and I'll go to Cafe Nero, wish it was Starbucks, but there isn't one near me, um, have a little fight with the barista because they always, you know, a slightly tense situation between us. Get annoyed on my walk back home and then sit down by seven and just write till about 12 or one and my brain is working. And then around 12 or one, my brain just stops working and any writing I do beyond that would be counterproductive. Uh, so I just stop. And in the old days, that was a real problem for me because it's like, what do you what do? you do? How do you feel the, you know, the 
black void for the rest of the day. Um, so I started exercising. Um, and then I, so I exercise for an hour or so. And then I'll try, it's like if I have to write some more, if there's some terrible deadline, I might manage another 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, or, or, or I'll sort of plan for the next day by sort of, because I write non-fiction, there's a lot of, writing non-fiction is a bit like kind of running a kind of business, you know, you have to, you have to kind of, you know, set up interviews and book planes. And so I'll do that in the afternoon. But if I miss my, um, if I miss like 7 a.m. till 12, 1 p.m., if I miss, I'm, I'm miserable for the whole day because that's the only time I can write. It's like, a, it's like the day is, is wasted if I can't write. Although I have noticed if I have a lion, I can write till about three in the afternoon. So maybe I should just give myself a break and have a lion. <laughs>